All right, class, welcome to chapter seven of All Quiet on the Western Front. You remember from chapter six that they have returned from the front. They were there um, from spring until autumn, suffered heavy casualties. Only 32 men have come back from the front. That means, out, and that was out of 150. So they lost many, many men. They have taken us farther back than usual to a field depot so that we can be reorganized. Our company needs more than 100 reinforcements. In the meantime, when we are off duty, we loaf around. After a couple of days, Himmelstoss comes up to us. He has had the bounce knocked out of him since he has been in the trenches and wants to get on good terms with us. I am willing because I saw how he brought High Vestus in when he was hit in the back. Besides, he's decent enough to treat us in the canteen when we are out of funds. Only Jaden is still reserved and suspicious. So now that Himmelstoss has gone through the trenches, um, he's not all cocky and rough and tough um, and all talk like he was before. In fact, High Vestus died in the previous chapter. Um, he had a shot to the midsection. His lung was exposed. It was very awful. And we find out that it was Himmelstoss who um, carried him back when he was wounded. But Jaden is still suspicious, and that makes sense because he was treated the worst by Himmelstoss. But even Jaden is won over too when Himmelstoss tells us that he is taking the place of the sergeant cook who has gone on leave. As a proof, he produces on the spot two pounds of sugar for us and a half pound of butter, especially for Jaden. He even sees to it that we are detailed the next two or three days to the cookhouse for potato and turnip peeling. The grub he gives us there is real officer's fare. So kind of like a peace offering, giving them um, some good, good food. Thus momentarily, we have the two things a soldier needs for contentment, good food and rest. That's not much when one comes to think of it. A few years ago, we would have despised ourselves terribly, but now we are almost happy. It is all a matter of habit, even the front line. Habit is the explanation of why we seem to forget things so quickly. Yesterday, we were under fire. Today we act the fool and go foraging through the countryside. Tomorrow we go up to the trenches again. We forget nothing really, but so long as we have to stay here in the field, the front line days when they are past sink down in us like a stone. They are too grievous for us to be able to reflect on them at once. If we did that, we should have been destroyed long ago. I soon found out this much. Terror can be endured so long as a man simply ducks, but it kills if a man just thinks about it. So the only way to cope with the horror, with the awfulness of what they go through at the front line is to just not think about it. Just as we turn into animals when we go to the line, because that is the only thing which brings us through safely, so we turn into wags and loafers when we are resting. We can do nothing else. It is a sheer necessity. We want to live at any price, so we cannot burden ourselves with feelings which, though they might be ornamental enough in peacetime, would be out of place here. Hemerick is dead. High Vestus is dying. They will have a job with Hans Kramer's body at the judgment day, piecing it together after a direct hit. Martins has no legs anymore. Meyer is dead. Max is dead. Fire is dead. Hammerling is dead. There are 120 wounded men lying somewhere or other. It is a damnable business. But what has it to do with us now? We live. If it were possible for us to save them, then it would be seen how much we cared. We would have a shot at it, though we went under ourselves where we can be damned quixotic or idealistic when we like. Fear we do not know much about. Terror of death, yes, but that's a different matter. That is physical. So I misspoke earlier. High Vestus is not dead yet, but he is dying. But our comrades are dead. We cannot help them. They have their rest. And who knows what is waiting for us. We will make ourselves comfortable and sleep and eat as much as we can stuff into our bellies and drink and smoke so that hours are not wasted. Life is short. The terror of the front sinks deep down when we turn our back upon it. We are grim, coarse jokes about it. When a man dies, then, excuse me, let me back up. Um, the terror of the front sinks deep down when we turn our back upon it. We make grim, coarse jokes about it when a man dies, and then we say he's nipped off his turd. And so we speak of everything. That keeps us from going mad. As long as we take it that way, we maintain our own resistance. So they make these jokes that are, I mean, they are inappropriate jokes um, about dying and about death, but it's the only way they can mentally handle it. 
um, similar to the way um, you guys know when things get uncomfortable, when like uncomfortable topics come up in the classroom, first thing people tend to do is to like make a joke. That's kind of human nature. Um, it's hard to deal with. We don't know how to deal with it. So we make jokes that we probably shouldn't about it. But we do not forget, it's all rot that they put in the war news about the good humor of the troops, how they are arranging dances almost before they are out of the front line. We don't act like that because we are in a good humor. We're in a good humor because otherwise we should go to pieces. Even so, we cannot hold out much longer. Our humor becomes more bitter every month. And this I know, all these things that now, while we are still in the war, sink down in us like a stone, after the war shall waken again, and then shall begin the disentanglement of life and death. So everything that they're stuffing down inside, that they're not thinking about, that they're avoiding, Paul says, after the war, it's going to rise back up. And we're going to have to disentangle. We're going to have to take apart all of this. And that's the mental struggle of people, um, any war veteran, the PTSD that they deal with. The days, the weeks, the years out here shall come back again, and our dead comrades shall then stand up again and march with us. Our heads shall be clear. We shall have a purpose, and we shall march. Our dead comrades beside us, the years at the front behind us. Against whom? Against whom? Some time ago, there was an army theater in these parts. Colored posters of the performances are still sticking on a hoarding, with wide eyes crop and eyes stand in front of it. So there was um, a, a, an acting theater came through and there's still like the, the billboard posters um, advertising it. We can hardly credit that such things still exist. A girl in a light summer dress with a red patent leather belt about her hips. She is standing with one hand on a railing and with the other she holds a straw hat. She wears white stockings and white shoes, fine buckle shoes with high heels. Behind her smiles the blue sea with white horses at the side of is a bright bay. She's a lovely girl with a delicate nose, red lips and slender legs, wonderfully clean and well cared for. She certainly bathes twice a day and never has any dirt under her nails, at most perhaps a bit of sand from the beach. Beside her stands a man in white trousers, a blue jacket and a sailor's cap, but he interests us much less. The girl on the poster is a wonder to us. We have quite forgotten that there are such things and even now we hardly believe our eyes. We have seen nothing like it for years, nothing like it for happiness, beauty, and joy. That is peacetime. That is as it should be. We feel excited. So they're just seeing a, a poster, basically what we would see as a movie poster today, and there's a woman on it. And they just can't, they're just amazed because they haven't seen something so simple and peaceful in so long. Just look at those thin shoes, though. She couldn't march many miles in those, I say, and then begin to feel silly, for it's absurd to stand in front of the picture like this and think of nothing but marching. How old would she be, Crop asked. About 22 at the most, I hazard. Then she would be older than us. She's not more than 17, let me tell you. It gives us goose flesh. Look at goosebumps. That would be good, Albert. What do you think? He nods. I have some white trousers at home, too. White trousers, say I, but a girl like that. We look askance at one another. There's not much to boast of here. Two ragged, stained, and dirty uniforms. It's hopeless to compete. So we proceed to tear the young man with the white trousers off the picture. Take care not to damage the girl. That is something toward it. We could go and get de-loused anyway, Crop then suggests. But to get de remember, a louse is a singular form of life. To get de-loused is to go and get all the life off of you. I am not very enthusiastic because it doesn't do one's clothes any good and a man is lousy again inside two hours but when we have considered the picture once more I declare myself willing. I go even further. We might see if we could get a clean shirt as well. Socks might be better says Albert not without reason. Yes socks too perhaps. Let's go and explore a bit. Then Lear and Jaden stroll up. They look at the poster and immediately the conversation becomes muddy. Lear was the first of our class to have intercourse, and we gave, he gave stirring details of it. After his fashion, he enjoys himself over the picture, and Jaden supports him nobly. It does not distress us exactly. Who isn't smutty is no soldier. It merely does not suit us at the moment, so we edge away and march off to the de-lousing station with the same feeling as if we were a swell gentleman's outfitters. 
the houses in which we are billeted and billets are temporary housing for soldiers. The houses in which we are billeted lie near the canal. On the other side of the canal, there are ponds flanked with poplars. On the other side of the canal, there are women too. The houses on the, our side have been abandoned. On the other side though, one occasionally sees inhabitants. In the evening, we go swimming. Three women come strolling along the bank. They walk slowly and don't look away, although we have no bathing suits. So the men are bathing naked in the river. Uh, this is our first um, that we see any women in the novel. It's been all men so far. Lear calls out to them. They laugh and stop to watch us. We fling remarks at them in broken French, anything that comes into our heads, hastily and all jumbled together, anything to detain them. They are not specially wonderful pieces, but then where are such to be had about here? So remember, they're in France. Uh, the Western Front is in France, a little bit into to Belgium. So these are French women, so they're trying to recall any French that they've learned um, to get the women to stop and talk to them. There's one slim little brunette, her teeth gleam when she laughs. She has quick movements, her dress swings loosely about her legs. Although the water is cold, we are very jovial, excited, and do our best to interest them so that they will stay. We try to make jokes, and they answer with things we cannot understand. We laugh and beckon. Jaden is more crafty. He runs into the house, gets a loaf of army bread, and holds it up. That produces a great effect. And remember, people are starving during this war, um, so just a piece of bread is a really exciting thing. They nod and, and beckon for us to come over, but we don't dare do that. It's forbidden to cross to the opposite bank. There are sentries on all the bridges. It's impossible without a pass. So we indicate that they should come over to us, but they shake their heads and point to the bridge. They are not, not allowed to pass either. They turn back and walk slowly down the canal, keeping along the towpath all the way. We accompany them swimming. After a few hundred yards, they turn off and point to a house that stands a little distance away among the trees and shrubbery. Lear asks if they live there. They laugh. Sure, that's their house. We call out to them that we would like to come sometime when the guards cannot see us. At night, tonight. They raise their hands, put them together, rest their faces on them and shut their eyes. They understand. The slim brunette does a two-step. The blonde girl twitters, bread, good. Eagerly, we assure them that we will bring some with us and other tasty bits too. We roll our eyes and try to explain with our hands. Lear nearly drowns trying to demonstrate a sausage. If it were necessary, we would promise them a whole quartermaster store. They go off and frequently turn and look back. We climb out on the bank on our side of the canal and watch to see whether they go into the house, for they might easily have been lying. Then we swim back. No one can cross the bridge without leave, so we will simply have to swim over tonight. We are full of excitement. We cannot last out without a drink, so we go to the canteen where there is beer and a kind of punch. We drink punch and tell one another lying tales of our experiences. Each man gladly believes the other man's story, only waiting impatiently till he can cap it with a taller one. Our hands are fidgety. We smoke countless cigarettes until Crap says, we might as well take them a few cigarettes too. So we put some inside our caps to keep them. The sky turns apple green. There are four of us, but only three can go. We must shake off Jaden, so ply him with rum and punch until he rocks. As, he turns, as it turns dark, we go to our billets, Jaden in the center. We are glowing and full of a lust for adventure. The little brunette is mine. We have settled all that. So there's only three women, but there's four guys. Um, so they decide, well, Jaden isn't going to go with us. We, we, we got to somehow um, get rid of him. Jaden drops on his sack of straw and snores. And, and to get rid of him, they've got him really, really drunk. He drops on his sack of straw and snores. Once he wakes up and grins so craftily that we are alarmed and begin to think he's cheating and that we have given him the punch to no purpose. Then he drops back again and sleeps on. We each get hold of a whole army loaf and wrap it up in newspaper. The cigarettes we put in two, as well as three good rations of liver sausage that were issued to us this evening. That makes a decent present. We stow the things carefully in our boots. We have to take them to protect our feet against treading on wire and broken grass on the other bank. As we must swim for it, we can take no other clothes, but it is not far and quite dark. So they're not wearing anything. Um, and they've got the, the food and the cigarettes uh, wrapped up in newspaper, tucked in their boots. We make off with our boots in our hands. 
Swiftly we slip into the water, lie on our backs and swim, holding the boots with our contents up over our heads. So this completely comical image. Um, they're on their back swimming, doing some sort of backstroke, um, and, and they've got the boots held above them so that they don't get wet. We climb out carefully on the opposite bank, take out the packages and put on our boots. We put the things under our arms. And so, all wet and naked, clothed only in our boots, we break into a trot. We find the house at once. It lies among the trees. Lear trips over a root and skins his elbow. No matter, he says gaily. The windows are shuttered. We slip round the house and try to peer through the cracks. Then we grow impatient. Suddenly, Prop hesitates. What if there's a major with them? Then we just clear off, grins Lear. He can try to read our regimental numbers here. And he smacks us behind. The door of the courtyard stands open. Our boots make a great clatter. The house door opens. A chink of light shines through, and a woman cries out in a scared voice. Shh, shh, comrade, bon ami, we say, and show our packages protestingly. The other two are now on the scene, and the door opens and light floods over us. They recognize us and all three burst into laughter at our appearance. They rock and sway in the doorway they laugh so much. How supple their movements are. One moment, they disappear and throw us bits of clothing which we gladly wrap around ourselves. Then we are allowed in. A small lamp burns in their room which is warm and smells a little of perfume. We unwrap our parcels and hand them over to the women. Their eyes shine. It is obvious they are hungry. Then we all become rather embarrassed. Lear makes the gestures of eating, and then they come to life again and bring out plates and knives and fall to on the food, and they hold up every slice of liver sausage and admire it before they eat it, and we sit proudly by. They overwhelm us with their chatter. We understand very little of it, but we listen, and the words sound friendly. No doubt we all look very young. The little brunette strokes my hair and says what all French women say, la guerre, grand malheur, pauvre garçon. I hold her arm tightly and press my lips into the palm of her hand. Her fingers close round my face. Close above me are her bewildering eyes, the soft brown of her skin and her red lips. Her mouth speaks words I do not understand, nor do I fully understand her eyes. They seem to say more than we anticipated when we came here. There are other rooms adjoining. In passing, I see Lear. He has made a great hit with the blonde. He's an old hand at the game, but I, I am lost in remoteness in weakness and in a passion to which I yield myself trustingly. My desires are strangely compounded of yearning and misery. I feel giddy. There's nothing here that a man can hold on to. We have left our boots at the door. They have given us slippers instead, and now nothing remains to recall for me the assurance and self-confidence of the soldier. No rifle, no belt, no tunic, no cap. I let myself drop into the unknown, come what may. Yet in spite of it all, I feel somewhat afraid. So when they're not dressed up in their soldiers' uniforms, with their rifle and their boots and their everything, they, they don't know how to act because that's all they've done for the last couple of years is, is trained to be a soldier. The little brunette contracts her, brown, her brows when she is thinking, but when she talks, they are still, and often sound does not quite become a word, but suffocates or floats away over me half finished. An arch, a pathway, a comet, what have I known of it? What do I know of it? The words of this foreign tongue that I hardly understand, they caress me to a quietness in which the room grows dim and dissolves in the half light. Only the face above me lives and is clear. How various is a face, but an hour ago it was strange and it is now touched with the tenderness that comes, not from it, but from out of the night. The world and the blood, all these things seem to shine in it together. The objects in the room are touched by it and transformed. They become isolated, and I feel almost awed at the sight of my clear skin when the light of the lamp falls upon it and the cool brown hand passes over it. How different this is from the conditions in the soldiers' brothels to which we are allowed to go and where we have to wait in long lines. I wish I never thought of them, but desire turns my mind to them involuntarily, and I am afraid for it might be impossible ever to be free of them again. But then I feel the lips of the little brunette and press myself against them. My eyes close. I want it all to fall from me, war and terror and grossness, in order to awaken young and happy. I think of the picture of the girl on the poster and for a moment believe that my life depends on winning here. And if I press ever deeper into the arms that embrace me, perhaps a miracle may happen. 
So after a time, we find ourselves reassembled again. Lear is in high spirits. We pull on our boots and take our leave warmly. The night air cools our hot bodies. The rustling poplars loom large in the darkness. The moon floats in the heavens and in the waters of the canal. We do not run. We walk beside one another with long strides. That was worth a ration loaf, says Lear. I cannot trust myself to speak. I am not in the least happy. Then we hear footsteps and dodge behind a shrub. The steps come nearer, close by us. We see a naked soldier in boots, just like ourselves. He has a package under his arm and gallops onward. It is Jaden in full course. He has disappeared already. We laugh. In the morning, he will curse us. Unobserved, we arrive again at our sacks of straw. So we get that silly image. Um, they've um, had their time at the house with the ladies. They're walking back to their billets. And there's Jaden um, realizing he was left behind um, and running to, to go see the ladies. I am called to the orderly room. The company commander gives me a leave pass and a travel pass and wishes me a good journey. I look to see how much leave I have got. 17 days, 14 days leave and three days for traveling. It's not enough and I ask whether I cannot have five days for traveling. For Tink points to my pass. There I see that I am not to return to the front immediately. After my leave, I have to report for a course of training to a camp on the moors. And the moors, um, those are, plains um, where there's not many trees, it's mostly just grasses and some shrubs, um, and it's usually windy and cold and damp. So he's going on leave. Um, he gets some time away from the war to go home. The others envy me. Cat gives me good advice and tells me I ought to try to get a base job. If you're smart, you'll hang on to it. I would rather not have gone for another eight days. We are to stay here that much longer, and it is good here. Naturally, I have to stand the others' drinks at the canteen. We are all a little bit drunk. I become gloomy. I will be away for six weeks. That is lucky, of course, but what may happen before I get back? Shall I meet all these fellows again? Already High and Kemmerich have gone. Who will be the next? So he's only getting a couple weeks off to be home, but he's going to be gone a full six weeks because he has to spend a month at another camp doing some training. As we drink, I look at each of them in turn. Albert sits beside me and smokes. He is cheerful. We have always been together. Opposite spots Cat with his drooping shoulders, his broad thumb and calm voice. Mueller with the projecting teeth and the booming laugh. Jaden with his mousy eyes. Lear who has grown a full beard and looks at least 40. Over us hangs the dense cloud of smoke. Where would a soldier be without tobacco? The canteen is his refuge and beer is far more than a drink. It is a token that a man can move his limbs and stretch in safety. We do it ceremonially. We stretch our legs out in front of us and spit deliberately. That is the only way. How it all rises up before a man when he's going away the next morning. At night, we go again to the other side of the canal. I'm almost afraid to tell the little brunette that I'm going away. And when I return, we'll be, we will be far from here. We will never see one another again. At first, I'm at a loss to understand. And then it dawns on me. Yes, Lear is right. If I were going up to the front, then she would have called me again, pauvre garçon. But merely going on leave? She doesn't want to hear about that. That's not nearly so interesting. May she go to the devil with her chattering talk. A man dreams of a miracle and wakes up to loaves of bread. So this brunette that he's having such a good time with um, doesn't really want to hear that he's going home. But if, she was going, if he were going to the front, he'd be much more interested. So he realizes that she's kind of only interested in, in, in the danger and the fact that he may die. So he gets angry at her. Next morning, after I have been deloused, I go to the railhead. Albert and Kat come with me. At the halt, we learn that it will be a couple of hours yet before the train leaves. The other two have to go back to duty. We take leave of one another. Good luck, Kat. Good luck, Albert. They go off and wave once or twice. Their figures dwindle. I know their every step and movement. I would recognize them at a distance. Then they disappear. I sit down on my pack and wait. Suddenly I become filled with an, a consuming impatience to be gone. I lie down on many a station platform. I stand before many a soup kitchen. I squat on many a bench. So as he's traveling on train and the trains stop and people get off and new people get on, uh, he's seeing lots of different train stations. Then at last the landscape becomes disturbing, mysterious, and familiar. 
It glides past the western windows with its villages, their thatched roofs like caps, pulled over the whitewashed, half-timbered houses, its cornfields gleaming like mother of pearl in the slanting light, its orchards, its barns, and old lime trees. The names of the stations begin to take on meaning, and my heart trembles. The train stamps and stamps onward. I stand at the window and hold on to the frame. These names mark the boundaries of my youth. Smooth meadows, fields, farmyards, a solitary team moves against the skyline along the road that runs parallel to the horizon, a barrier before which peasants stand waiting, girls waving, children playing on the embankment, roads leading into the country, smooth roads without artillery. It is evening, and if the train does not rattle, I should cry out. The plain unfolds itself. In the distance, the soft blue silhouette of the mountain ranges begins to appear. I recognize the characteristic outline of the Doldenberg, a jagged comb springing up precipitously from the limits of the forest. Behind it should lie the town. But now the sun streams through the world, dissolving everything in its golden red light. The train swings round one curve and then another. Far away in a long line, one behind the other, stand the poplars, unsubstantial, playing and dark, fashioned out of shadow, light and desire. The field swings round as the train encircles it, and the intervals between the trees diminish. The trees become a block, and for a moment I see only one. Then they reappear from behind the foremost tree and stand out a long line against the sky until they are hidden by the first houses. Who's describing um, coming up to the line of poplars? They've been mentioned before. They grow um, all in a line here. And as he's driving up to it, there's many trees, but you get to that exact point where you only see one because now you're right next to the line. Um, and then as soon as he passes it, all the trees reappear again. A street crossing. I stand by the window. I cannot drag myself away. The others put their baggage ready for getting out. I repeat to myself the names of the street that we cross over. Remerstrasse, Remerstrasse. Below there are cyclists, lorries, men. It is a gray street and a gray subway. It affects me as though it were my mother. Then the train stops and there is the station with noise and cries and signboards. I pick up my pack and fasten the strap. I take my rifle in my hand and stumble down the steps. On the platform I look round. I know no one among all the people hurrying to and fro. A Red Cross sister offers me something to drink. Um, so a Red Cross sister, the Red Cross was formed um, around this time. And these are nurses, they're volunteer nurses um, that would be all over Europe, um, helping on both sides. She offers me something to drink. I turn away, she smiles at me too foolishly, so obsessed with their own importance. Just look, I am giving a soldier coffee. She calls to me, comrade, but I will have none of it. Um, he gets upset. Uh, even though she doesn't literally say, look at me, I'm giving a soldier coffee. The way she's acting, he can see this like, um, this arrogant, everybody look at me doing a good deed and calling him comrade, not cool. Because she's not a comrade of his. She's not been through hell with him like Lear and Jaden and Kat and all of them have. Outside in front of the station, the stream roars alongside the street. It rushes foaming from the sluices of the mill bridge. There stands the old square watchtower. In front of it, the great mottled lime tree and behind it, the evening. Here we have often sat, how long ago it is. We have passed over this bridge and breathed the cool acid smell of the stagnant water. We have leaned over the still water on this side of the lock where the green creepers and weeds hang from the piles of the bridge. And on hot days, we rejoiced in the spouting foam on the other side of the lock and told tales about our school teachers. I pass over the bridge. I look right and left. The water is as full of weeds as ever, and it still shoots over in gleaming arches. In the tower building, laundresses still stand with bare arms as they used to over the clean linen, and the heat from the ironing pours out through the open windows. Dogs trot along the narrow street. Before the doors of the houses, people stand and follow me with their gaze as I pass by dirty and heavy laden. In this confectioner's, we used to eat ices, and there we learned to smoke cigarettes. Walking down the street, I know every shop, the grocers, the chemists, the bakers. Then at last, I stand before the brown door with its worn latch, and my hand grows heavy. I open the door, and a strange coolness comes out to meet me. My eyes are dim. The stairs creak under my boots. 
Upstairs, the door rattles. Someone is looking over the railing. It is the kitchen door that was opened. They are cooking potato cakes. The house reeks of it. And today, of course, is Saturday. That will be my sister leaning over. For a moment, I am shy and lower my head. Then I take off my helmet and look up. Yes, it is my eldest sister. Paul, she cries, Paul. I nod, my pack bumps against the banisters. My rifle is so heavy. She pulls the door open and calls, Mother, Mother, Paul is here. I can go no further. Mother, Mother, Paul is here. So something's happening to him. This isn't some wonderful, amazing homecoming where he throws open the door and says, I'm home, and then rushes in. He's moving very slowly and is very aware of the heaviness of what he's carrying. I lean against the wall and grip my helmet and rifle. I hold them as tight as I can, but I cannot take another step. The staircase fades before my eyes. I support myself with the butt of my rifle against my feet and clench my teeth fiercely, but I cannot speak a word. My sister's call has made me powerless. I can do nothing. I struggle to make myself laugh, to speak, but no word comes. And so I stand on the steps, miserable, helpless, paralyzed, and again, Against my will, the tears run down my cheeks. My sister comes back and says, why, what is the matter? Then I pull myself together and stagger on the landing. I lean my rifle in a corner. I set my pack against the wall, place my helmet on it, and fling down my equipment and baggage. Then I say fiercely, bring me a handkerchief. She gives me one from the cupboard and I dry my face. Above me on the wall hangs the glass case with the colored butterflies that once I collected. Now I hear my mother's voice. It comes from the bedroom. Is she in bed? I ask my sister. She is ill, she replies. I go into her, give her my hand, and say as calmly as I can, here I am, mother. She lies still in the dim light. Then she asks anxiously, are you wounded? And I feel her searching glance. No, I've got leave. My mother is very pale. I am afraid to make a light. Here I lie now, she says, and cry instead of being glad. Are you sick, mother? I ask. I'm going to get up a little today, she says, and turns to my sister, who's continually running to the kitchen to watch that the food does not burn, and put out that jar of preserved whortleberries. You like that, don't you? She asks me. Yes, mother, I haven't had any for a long time. We might almost have known you were coming, laughs my sister. There's just your favorite dish, potato cakes, and even whortleberries to go with them, too. And it is Saturday, I add. Sit here beside me, says my mother. She looks at me. Her hands are white and sickly and frail compared with mine. We say very little, and I am thankful that she asks nothing. What ought I to say? Everything I could have wished for has happened. I have come out of it safely, and I sit here beside her. And in the kitchen stands my sister, preparing supper and singing. Dear boy, says my mother softly. We were never very demonstrative in our family. So to be demonstrative would be to like show affection. Poor folk who toil and are full of cares are not so. It is not their way to protest what they already know. When my mother says to me, dear boy, it means much more than when another uses it. I know well enough that the jar of whortleberries is the only one they have had for months and that she has kept it for me. And the somewhat stale cakes that she gives to me too, she must have got them cheap some time and put them all by for me. I sit by her bed and through the window the chestnut trees in the beer garden opposite glow in brown and gold. I breathe deeply and say to myself, you are at home, you are at home, but a sense of strangeness will not leave me. I cannot feel at home amongst these things. There's my mother, there's my sister, there's my case of butterflies, and there's the mahogany piano, but I am not myself there. There's the distance a veil between us. So think about that. Why, why is he at home and yet he doesn't feel at home? He says there's a veil separating us. A veil would be like some sort of curtain uh, or, or sheet of some kind. I go and fetch my pack to the bedside and turn out the things I have brought. A whole Edamer cheese that Kat provided me with, two loaves of army bread, three quarters of a pound of butter, two tins of liver sausage, a pound of dripping, and a little bag of rice. I suppose you can make some use of that. They nod. Is it pretty bad for food here? I inquire. Yes, there's not much. Do you get enough out there? I smile and point to the things I have brought. Not quite always as much as that, of course, but we fare reasonably well. 
Erna takes away the food. Suddenly, my mother seizes hold of my hand and asks falteringly, Was it really bad out there, Paul? Mother, what should I answer to that? You would not understand. You could never realize it, and you shall never realize it. Was it bad, you ask? You, mother? I shake my head and say, No, mother, not so very. There's always a lot of us together, so it isn't so bad. Yes, but Heinrich Brendemeyer was just here lately and said it was terrible there now, with the gas and all the rest of it. It is my mother who says that. She says, with the gas and all the rest of it. She does not know what she is saying. She's merely anxious for me. Should I tell her how we once found three enemy trenches with their garrison all stiff as though stricken with apoplexy? Against the parapet in the dugouts, just where they were, the men stood and lay about with blue faces, dead? No, mother, that's only talk. I answer. There's not very much in what Fred and Meyer says. You see, for instance, I'm well and fit. Before my mother's tremulous anxiety, I recover my composure. Now I can walk about and talk and answer questions without fear of having suddenly to lean against the wall because the world turns as soft as rubber and my veins become brimstone. My mother wants to get up, so I go for a while to my sister in the kitchen. What's the matter with her? I ask. She shrugs her shoulders. She's been in bed some months now, but we did not want to write and tell you. Several doctors have been to see her. One of them said it is probably cancer again. All right, and that's where I'm going to pause. Um, we're only halfway through. Chapter seven is, is very long. So Paul's home, um, but he's not experiencing this great, wonderful sense of homecoming and belonging. Um, and he's just straight up lying to his mother. He says, you know, I could tell her the truth, uh, but he chooses not to. Um, he chooses to lie, um, perhaps not to worry her. All right, that's where we're going to stop. Thanks for listening.